have to type me to our... Yeah. Uh, right, we are on. Let's get the chat on. Thanks. Okay, Julie. Hello. Hello. Okay. Julie's joined us from Abbey, uh, not in Dubai, which I, where I thought it was. Uh, just had to come on this morning. Just talk about how she's found the uh, how she's found the journey of investing in UK pro property from overseas, uh, and I just want to talk about how you've managed to uh, how you've managed to do that, and you know keep saying, uh, you know, it's bad enough when uh, when you're in the UK trying to sort out solicitors and brokers and estate agents and all the rest of it. So it must be a real challenge for you doing that from another country. So, when when did you start investing in the UK from where you are now? Then. Um. We started investing in the UK before we moved over here, so in 2009. And then the plan was to carry on investing whilst we were here, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So that was 2009. So from, 2007, from 2009 to 2017, I kind of left it. I didn't, I just wanted to do more with property, but just couldn't really figure out how to do it all virtually. I worked with a sourcer, it went a bit wrong, and I just, you know, felt quite burnt and embarrassed about it all. So I waited, but then in 2017, it was then that I thought, I've been wanting to do UK property virtually for seven years. I'm, I'm boring myself by just kind of thinking about it, really. I kind of need to put up or shut up. And, um, um, you know, it just sort of, yeah, it just sort of coincided with a few other things that were going on in our lives. So in 2017, it was just like, right, well, let's figure out how to scale virtually uh, by hook or by crook kind of thing. Yeah, and and, so, and how and how did you how did you find that build? How did you start? I mean, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I, I can't. I couldn't book a taxi in in Abu Dhabi right now. And you've managed to buy property in the UK. I don't even know how far away you are. How many miles is it? <laughs> I think it's about four and a half thousand miles. But four and a half thousand miles away, yeah. and you've managed to buy property from there in the UK, to yeah. totally from being completely and utterly in another country. Yeah. So we were so. Mad. One of the one of the kind of triggers uh, was our life got turned upside down when um, my my father in law died. We came back to the UK for the funeral for five days, and my husband kind of like asked if me and the kids would stay in the UK for six months just to be around for his family. So that meant taking the kids out of school. It meant um, rent, finding a house to rent us, so we had to have somewhere to live, like getting furniture for the house that we're going to live in for six months, and then leave after six months. And um, I, had a, I had a virtual job at that time anyway, but with, you know, two, three-year-olds running around, I just, I just couldn't carry on doing that. It was a virtual um, uh, supporting a, a change management company. So I was quite used to working on cloud and things like that, but I just didn't have the time to sit down and do the work. So I had to scale back all that. So it's me and the kids in this, like, rented, we rented a farm, bizarrely. And although it was crazy with the kids and, like, you know, family situation that was going on, I just had like, we had to fill our days really. And I was just like, well, do you know what? Manchester's down the road. I've always wanted to kind of like do more. So I, I just, I, I started to do more in education because I had the time in the evenings when the kids were in bed because, you know, we didn't have social commitments or anything like that. And uh, we were there for six months. So I didn't buy anything whilst I was in, whilst I was in Manchester. It was more about education and, and things like that. Um, Somebody did approach me and ask me to start sourcing for them. They were kind of like, I just want a portfolio like yours because they already had a few houses. So they kind of wanted me to start to source for them. So it was like the stars kind of collided a bit. Like I had the desire to, to do it. I had the time because it was just me and the kids and, you know, we we're trying to just fill our time in this six months. And then I had somebody approach me and like say, can you, can you source me? Um, an expat approached me and asked me if I could source some properties for them. So it was like, I just kind of need to, get on and, and do this. So six months later, we then returned to Abu Dhabi. And it was like, well, I just need to carry on. And I'd found relatively virtual ways of doing things whilst I was in the UK, because I had to. So it was just a case of building on that. And it, it, it's a mindset, really. If you kind of like got your hands tied behind your back, you find ways of doing things. So mm. if you've got two kids running around all day, and you're trying to keep them and, and, and build a business, then you just find ways of doing things, whether you're four and a half thousand miles away or 20 miles down the road. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, when most people want to fill their time, you know, they take the dog for a walk or, you know, go to Tesco's or something, but you go move to another country and buy properties in another country. So it is quite it is quite unusual. The, the thing is, it's hard 
quite enough sometimes sourcing properties that you can go down the road and visit, let alone doing it from that kind of distance. So I suppose if you find a property that you want to buy, how do you go about checking that property out, getting a feel for it? Is this is this something that you 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 have another person for, or do you arrange it virtually with an agent? How, so, how do you do that? Yeah, no, good question. So I kind of I, I pivoted my area a little bit after well when I was back in Abu Dhabi. Um, just because the area that I used to buy in, which was sort of where I was from and knew really well, just the numbers didn't work anymore. Like, you know, seven years later, market forces have changed. So in terms of how, how we get things done, it's a combination, really, of we have a bit of a ground team. Uh, so people who we kind of like you know, can pay um, by, by the hour to do tasks that are required on, on the ground. It, so it's sort of like ad hoc work. Um, and then sometimes we have suppliers that we use if the ground team aren't available to do certain tasks. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's in terms of how we sort of like get things, how we sort of, yeah, get things done really. Great people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose you have to find that, don't you, from that distance? Because it's not like you can pop on a flight and have a check and just think, actually, that property's not for me and pop home. It's not quite like that for you, is it? You know, there's a bit more. Um, and then sometimes you'll have suppliers that you. Oh, there's a bit of a pause. Um, but some people do that, right? Some some expats do that. They do fly back to the UK um, mm -hmm. because it is a big investment. It's a big amount of money that you're talking about. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want life to be like that. Um, you know, my husband travels a lot with work normally. Um, the kids were were in school pre lockdown, so I kind of needed to be able to keep life on the road. You know, doing the school, handling husband's travel. You know, just all that. So um, I knew. Even if we're in the UK, to be honest, I'd have to get viewings done differently rather than just me doing them because, you know, someone's always sick off school. There's a random school holiday or something like that, which is a yeah. spanner in the works. If I was doing my own viewings, I'd be the most inconsistent person ever because life just gets in the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So what, what's your strategy in the UK so, then? Do you, yeah, do you look we at... try and make sure that we do a set of viewings each week. What what is your UK strategy? Are you do you do refurbs? Are you doing HMOs or buy to lets? Or what what is it that you do? What what type of properties projects do you look for? I've lost her. Yeah, no, I think I think. Can you hear me again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, so what's my strategy? So um, we do a combination. Someone said it's a bit like Monopoly. I hadn't really thought of it like that, but. Um, we do buy to lets and we do HMOs as well. Kind of aiming for aiming for a five to one ratio, like five buy to lets to one HMO, just to sort of um, just to spread risk and have diversity, um, you know, in in the portfolio and and also the amount of time that those take as well is different. It requires different amounts of time. So we we tend to go for properties that need a bit of for the buy to lets that need a bit of work doing on them so we can add value and do um, buy you know, with the finance kind of thing. Um, and for the HMOs, um, we've done a mixture of refurbing and also buying kind of like ones that have been ready-made that investors are just selling for different, you know, for different reasons because they just want out of that property. Yeah. So not only are you buying property from another country in another country, you're doing a refurbishment from another country in another country as well. Yeah. Uh, so you don't do things by halves, clearly. So <laughs> how on earth... Do you do that? I know people that buy buy refurb projects in their own town and they fuck it up. So I don't know how you're managing to do that from another country. <laughs> you just you kind of have to accept that that you're gonna, that you're going to make mistakes and that things are going to go wrong. And um, we've done projects for myself and, and projects for kind of like uh, you know investors or clients as well. And I've just had to accept that things are going to go wrong. But you know what? I kind of reconciled it with things would go wrong if I was in the UK, you know, somebody wouldn't turn up, somebody would get ill, someone would walk off a job. Like these things are going to happen when, when you're doing, when you're doing projects and whilst you're figuring out what the best way is to do them. So once I kind of like accepted that things are going to go wrong, when things go wrong, I'll just find solutions and ways around them rather than go, Oh, forget this. I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's just kind of like a mind, a mindset of things. And, yeah, things have gone wrong. The builder there, though, isn't it? You know, when you've got a refurb going off and you're saying, I want this, you're so far away. That's kind of like, it's almost like you're handing everything over, isn't it? A massive package and saying, this this just has to be delivered and, and, and you've got to get through. So you've got to have yeah, a good so have, relationship. We do. And we work with different builders. I always tend to try and ha I always tend to have a project manager in place. Um, so they're, they're my point of contact because they can attend regularly. 
And then we have, we tend to have our ground crew attending regularly as well. So the ground crew will turn up like, they're almost like me kind of thing. They'll turn up with coffees and biscuits and things like that every week or every other week. And then the project manager's managing the time and the budget and, and um, uh, quality and escalating issues. So we've worked, you know, we, we work with different project managers and builders over, over the last three years. We haven't just like got one, one set person that we work with. It's been a combination. Right, right. I mean, that, that must be, I can't imagine the, the, the stress and pressure that that must come with. You know? um, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's been, sometimes it's been stressful and sometimes it's been kind of like, yeah, on some projects I've thought, this is a model that I don't want to repeat again. Like we have to do it differently <laughs> next time. And then some projects are a bit more like, actually this, you know, everything we've done on this one has gone has gone right so let's try and learn from this like what what went well on this one what was the team dynamic and everything that we had set up on on this one but it's constantly, yeah. constantly do you have, you have like a system a system in place for how you're going to go about doing it like a sort of this is what i'm going to do now this is how i'm going to do it because it sounds like you kind of as you've made uh sort of mistakes or you've come across challenges you've worked out better ways of doing them so do you sort of have a set process you go through now when you're doing a refurbishment or, you, or you're doing a property from overseas to manage that that gap of not being able yeah, to be so on in terms of managing it or in, or in terms of defining all the, all the work that's needed or both everything. yeah both really from because you, you, you've obviously got, must have some kind of process to define what work you need and how you're going to manage that process and check it's done so you can you know get either yeah. out to tout or whatever it is you're doing with it yeah, okay. So we always get um, a building survey done, um, you know, after we've had an offer accepted, a full a full building survey. And I've, um, we make sure that the building survey we get done um, has got the has got the full scope of works, it's got pictures in there, and it's also got the definition of the spec of any works that need to get done, especially for structural works. Um, so that sort of gives us like the full, complete list of everything that needs to get done. And it's been, it's been done by an independent person because it's been done by the surveyor so then so then we can so then we can sort of like then i tend to work with the bit with the project manager on that and just say look you know here's every single little thing that needs doing on this house which are the things that we're going to do versus which are the things that we're going to say actually no we're not going to do that and the the survey tends to come back color coded like red amber green and you know so we tend to do the reds and then take a view whether we're going to do the the oranges. So the spec sort of comes from the scope of works comes from there really, um, and then once we've agreed the scope of work with the project manager, they um, sometimes I'll have in mind a builder who we're going to work with on that project, or sometimes the project manager will will um, you know find the builders. It, it depends on the size of the works. Really. It depends if we're talking about you know small bit of decoration, a bit of damp work and something, or a full bathrooms, kitchens, you know, DPC, the whole, the whole thing. Um, and then, then yeah, the, you know, the, the project manager manages the, manages the scope of works then. I catch up with them weekly or weekly or every, every other week. With some project managers, I've worked in a, in a sauna with them and we kind of like communicate in a sauna and keep everything in there. And that is a model that, I want to carry on working more towards really over the last three years some project managers i've not worked with in a sauna it's been more whatsapp and and things but it just it just works better when everything's in in one place like you can scroll back and see all the chat all the documents and um i've found that when we've done that there's been less need to have phone calls um than when you're doing it you know a bit more whatsappy and and um and email well, and we use what we use asana to run our business anyway sorry so it's more ad hoc if you're doing it via WhatsApp and, and things like that. If you've got everything in one place, then you can refer back to that. You don't have to ask a WhatsApp question because you can just think, I'll scroll back and find yeah. the answer for myself. So, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think that's a good system to have somewhere you can see everything in one place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, documents, well, pictures right. and all that kind of thing. So do you have a – Do you, have a, you must have. You must have a, a set, you know, I fit this kitchen in my properties and you must have a, a standard approach to, to a refurb and a, a, a suite of products that you use, do you? Or, or do you leave that up to your builder or are you not really asked? Yes, yes and no. Like, because um, the people who we work with are doing this all the time, right? So I don't want to be too rigid and say, it's this it's this speck of kitchen because what happens if that kitchen is not available? Quite often, there'll be a different kitchen on offer at the time, which is a better quality 
but for the same or less price than the one we'd usually go for. So we, you know, we tend to say like like this kitchen, but if there's something better available at the time for the same price, or if this isn't available, then go for something equivalent. So we tend to go for like white high gloss kitchens at the moment. Although in the HMO it was different, we did put a different uh, different style of kitchen in the HMO. Um, so yeah, we just we just tend to keep the buy to let refurb simple. You know, white white walls, greyish carpets, put blinds, um, um, white high gloss kitchens, grey floor. You know, just sort of simple, really. Yeah, and are you generating enough income from a UK property as a, to 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 have an, an income from them now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, from. From the properties that we did 10 years ago, I basically, um, I say created my own maternity pay. I didn't replace my corporate income from the houses that we bought before we moved out here. But um, I had sufficient income so that whilst the kids were babies and on maternity leave, like I had a choice of whether or not I, I took on other work. Um, and I felt like I had an income coming in. So, you know, it was still, not that you want to feel like you're contributing, but that there was still, there was still some money coming in every month from, from the buy to that I'd got in 2009. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't replace our salary, yet, but it will do. And that's why we're just repeating, you know, just repeating by to let repeating HMOs um, staying focused on 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 what we know, really. Like you hear about all these big and exciting projects and everything. But I'm like, I'm four and a half thousand miles away. I've kind of got to keep something simple. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the new challenge, isn't it? You need to buy and uh, do, do some kind of refurbishment in a factory into like a hundred apartments or something, and really push the boat out. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we would we would like to, uh, you know, do do something. We're starting to do, um, we're starting to do like leases to um, not social housing, but you know, to I can't think of what the word is. But leasing properties on on fixed terms to like social entities, we're starting to do some of that sort of thing because the rents low but the income's higher. Um, and I've always wanted to have that kind of like diversity in the portfolio as well, just because that income then yeah guaranteed whilst we're focusing on some other stuff. Um, yeah. So have you have you ever considered looking at? I know we're supposed to be talking about the UK, but have you ever considered looking at property market in Abu Dhabi? I've got no idea what that would be like, or is it too expensive, or is it just don't flick your switch or what yeah we it, it, it was definitely a decision point when we first moved over here because we, we bought we bought uk properties we had a little model that, that, that we repeated to get those we came over here and it was like do we do we just like start looking here and i decided no for a few reasons um um the the, the building's sort of like different here like the, just the fact that you've got sunshine and the effect that the sunshine has on the buildings like buildings deteriorate over a short period of time so you've not got any 100-year-old buildings here, for example. Um, mm. You've not got a land registry. This sounds really silly, but I really value the UK land registry. <laughs> you know, there's just a lot of um, a lot of weight behind that. And I never really realised it until I started to realise that other countries just haven't, you know, got that, that kind of setup. I don't speak Arabic. Not that you have to speak Arabic, but I... Um, you know, we just feel vulnerable, or not vulnerable, but I just want to feel comfortable buying a property in a language where I didn't really understand everything that was written down or the small print. And then as a next part, fourth, fourthly, you always know that you're going to leave at some point. And the UK will always be our home and our base. Wherever we go in between and whatever we do in between, the UK will always be our base. So I kind of wanted our business to be to be there, really. Um so yeah, I just I just decided I didn't really have an appetite for, for doing it here. So once I'd realised that, I just never really uh, looked at the market here. Right, right. That's interesting. I, I don't think I would be that way. I think I'd be the other way around. But I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a nightmare with stuff like that. You know, oh, let's, <laughs> let's try this and then go buy this and then we'll see what happens. You know, then it falls on its ass and then you have to start again. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that is. I can't. I can't even begin to imagine what that must be like to try and to try and manage a refurb from another country. That must be. Uh, you seem quite relaxed and blasé about it, but that for me, I'd, I get stressed if I've got a project forty miles away and I can't get to it. <laughs> I'm stuck in a traffic, and you're four and a half thousand miles away and don't even want to go look at it or can yeah. can look at it. So it must be. Uh, I can't imagine what that must be like. What What, what do you it's think? Weird. Yeah. yeah, but it's weird. Yeah. I think one of the things is as well, if, if that's how you've started to do it and you've got you you've got confidence in that and you, you you've had um 
results, haven't you? So you you probably the first one was probably the most stressful, and then you keep seeing it's working. Yes, you've learned lessons along the way, but that just feeds into your confidence of being able to do it, doesn't it? So if you've done it ten times and you've had ten wins with some challenges and a few learned, you're just perfecting that model. And yeah. it, it's really inspirational because there's a lot of people and they're not necessarily, you know, maybe they work offshore or maybe, you know, they're, they're abroad quite a lot and, and they're, they're wanting to get into property, but they feel like they're not around enough to do it. So it's inspirational for people to see it can be done. It's mm -hmm. just adapting that to a more virtual method. And, and with COVID-19, then it's kind of like you've trailblazed before, before that happened to say this is how it can be done. You don't need to to be sat with the estate agent, you know, and walking around and handshaking everybody and physically being there, there are other means of, of doing it. And that, yeah. so that's really great. Yeah. And, and some people, some people sort of don't, don't get the virtual aspect and, and they're not comfortable with it. You know, you, you'll get, you'll get some people who maybe just want to speak to you on the phone all the time, or, or will just say, Oh, well, it's because you're overseas. That's why that went wrong. It's because you're not here. That's where that went wrong. And, and at that point, you just sort of think, well, th this relationship isn't going to work then because I'm overseas. And the reason why things the reason why things don't go right or the reason why things go wrong isn't because I'm overseas. It's because there's a problem in the process. There's a problem with with something else. It's not because I'm I'm sat four and a half thousand miles away. So at that point, you know, we just sort of, you know, find find other people to to work with. And, um, you know, it really is a case of just co constantly finding finding new people who just get it and, and who want to work with us. So it is all about the people that were, that were yeah, working yeah. really. That's a really interesting thing you just said there, that, uh, you know, the, the problem isn't because I'm four and a half thousand miles away. And you're right, it's not, is it? The, the, yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, that, that can really easily be used as an excuse, really, really easily. Like yeah, a lot of people email me and say, oh, you know, well, this was late or delayed. Or, it, it, it's because of the distance, isn't it? I'm like, no, thank you for giving me the excuse and the get out of jail free card. But it's actually not about that. It's because I, it's because I messed up and didn't have that item in my checklist. It didn't, or me or my VA didn't let you know that. That's the reason. I'll put that in my checklist now and next time it won't happen. Yeah, 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 it's got absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I live here. And yes. Yeah, yeah, no, that is a good point. Because the people that live here that have got developments, they also experience delays. They also experience mm. disruptions. Yeah. Things don't go perfectly because they're here. Mm. And actually, sometimes, and um, I mean this with the greatest of respect to people, but as as builders, which is what we are, we often find that some things often go wrong when they are here. <laughs> yeah. because they'll, they'll turn up on site and they'll go, oh, actually. Now I'm here. What I'd really like to do is change the specification, but that's you're yeah. not going to do that when you're. So actually, there were there were the pros and cons, aren't they? There's two yeah, sides yeah, to that yeah. coin, indeed. So you sound like a dream client, to be honest. I'd love, I'd love it for my clients living in Dubai. That'd be ace. <laughs> I've done it again. It's not Dubai, is it? I would have it. <laughs> when you move to Dubai, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll leave yeah. there. It'll be easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's uh, no, that's um, that's really interesting. Uh, we we right we are we are gonna have to get off. I've got another one starting in six minutes. So uh, oh, it. it's been fantastic speaking to you. Uh, thanks for jumping on at uh, you know coming out of the sun to talk to us this morning. Uh, been Pleasure. really good. Been really good. Uh, hope to catch Thank up with you me. really soon. No problem at all. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say bye and thanks very much. But I also just wanted to point out Paul was mocking us about our sense of direction. Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, take care. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, Julie. Good to see you. Ta -ra, ta -ra.